I'd like to tell you that when faith begins to work in your life, you begin to do things that you were not supposed to be able to do. You begin to act a little bit different. You begin to walk a little bit different. You begin to change a little bit different. You make a decision that you're going to separate from the doubters and the unbelief. And when Jesus begins to call you, you just rise up. Come on, somebody shout, rise up and separate. One of the great stories that we see where Jesus is defining so many things about his ministry is in Mark chapter 3. How many of you will give me about 15 or 20 minutes from this point right here? Let me see your hand if you give me 15 minutes. 15, 30, 45, 60. That was really bad. I shouldn't have done that. Mark chapter 3. Let's read it together. Beginning in verse 1. They'll put it on the screen for us. And Jesus entered again into the synagogue, and there met him a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, they watched Jesus, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, on the church day, so they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. One translation says, Stand up and step forward. And he said unto him, unto them, now is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they were quiet. They held their peace. So he looked round about upon them with anger. I looked that word up in the Greek, and it means he was really upset. How many of you think you ought not get God mad? being grieved because of the hardness of their hearts. So he said to the man with the withered hand, stretch forth thine hand. Say that with me, church. Stretch forth thine hand. That's so important. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Now you notice it doesn't say that his hand was healed. It says he was restored. How many of you are glad we serve the God of restoration? Amen. Listen to this word, restored. And I've talked on this, uh, I guess, all of my life as a minister. But now listen to this right here. The word restored is the word apokathistomy. Won't you say apokathistomy? That's the Greek word that the word restored comes out of. It's used a few times in the Bible. It's an interesting word. And Jesus just happened to use it right here. And the word restored, uh, apokathistomy in the Greek, let me teach just for a second, uh, literally means to reconstruct, reconstitute. Uh, you can get this out of Strong's or Vines or, or, or uh, Bulliard's or any of those particular uh, commentaries. Uh, to reorganize, to restore, to permanently redo. So Jesus reconstructed his hand, restored it. Now listen, this man was in a place where he was not supposed to be. According to the law, if you had a defect like that, you were not supposed to go into that teaching chamber. You were, uh, the Bible uh, talks about different uh, illnesses that people had or physical problems, and they were to not go into certain parts of the temple. The, the scriptures talk about it. Well, here, this man had had uh, a hand that somehow or another got messed up. And so with that messed up hand, uh, he had some limitations. Now listen to this. But instead of him allowing that limitation to stop him, he found a way. I believe he was uh, looking for the possibility of help. Secondly, I think he was probably happy he had found a crowd that would let him associate with them. Uh, inside the temple even though he wasn't supposed to be there. Maybe, maybe he had just kind of learned to live with it and so consequently he had uh, learned that there were certain people that he could kind of run with so he's sitting with a crowd that obviously would know that he has an issue. And then here comes Jesus on the Sabbath. 
the very nerve of Jesus going to church. And Jesus comes there, and the scripture says, Jesus, uh, when he comes in, all of the people start saying, I wonder if Jesus is going to heal that one. Or maybe they thought it was a setup. Maybe they planted this guy in there to see if Jesus was going to violate the law by healing on the Sabbath, which they could accuse him then of working. Uh, one thing's for sure, they were there to see and to watch. And Jesus, one of the first things Jesus does is he tells the man to, to stand up and step forward. Let me just segue for a moment. Can I tell you that when God is beginning to restore something in your life, oftentimes he begins to separate you from whatever has made room for your uh, fallen situation and just kind of learn to live with it. He'll begin to separate you from it. Someone shout, stand up. Stand up. Come on, say, step forward. step forward. Look, when God begins to deal with your life, he begins to stand your life up totally different than what you could have even imagined, and you can be sure that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And God is going to begin to step you forward, which usually is going to separate you from what has been holding you back. Oh, hallelujah. If I were on drugs, and I'm not, but if I were on drugs and I wanted to get off of drugs, I don't mind telling you, I would separate from whoever's given me my drugs. And as I step forward toward the Lord, I'd begin to separate from that. You say, it's not that simple. Well, make it that simple. And watch what God does in your life. It's wonderful how the Holy Spirit, this man first, now listen, don't ever forget what pastor about to say. He had to first take a step toward Jesus. He began to separate from the issue and go toward the answer. And when he did that, something powerful began to happen. It incited those who were losing control of him to suddenly look at Jesus and decide what's he going to do. Can we capture him like this? Can we accuse Jesus of doing something that you're not supposed to do because that's like work if you heal someone when they go to church. And under the law, they said it was a man's custom that, by that point, but they said we don't want to do that kind of stuff because it's on the Sabbath day and it wouldn't be lawful. Well, Jesus just says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just write a new law right here. I'll just do what God wants. And so the scripture says, the man stepped forward, Jesus turned and looked at him, and when he looked at him, the, the scripture says, an anger began to fill him, because their heart was so hard that they could not receive the mercy, the goodness, and the joy of the Lord. So he turns to the man with the withered hand, and he says, stretch forth thine hand. Now listen to me, listen. He didn't say, stretch forth your withered hand. He didn't say stretch forth your crippled hand. I don't mind telling you that this man probably did not go around in society doing that. If someone acted like they wanted to shake hands with him, he probably stretched out his good hand. It would just be his normal reflex. But when he got into the presence of the one who can make a difference, something went off on the inside of him and he said, I've already made the first step. I've already started coming forward. I've already begun to separate from the doubt, the unbelief, the accusers, all of the anger ones, the ones that have been offended, the ones that have been hurt in church, ones that have done everything else that have been holding me back and just making a place for me to stay in there and control me with their misery. And now, not only do I have my problem, but now I'm surrounded by those who've got their own problems. Instead, when Jesus, come on, shout Jesus. When Jesus began to call him, he begins to separate from that crowd and he begins to move toward the crowd of one, toward Jesus. And Jesus said to him, stretch forth thine hand. And instead of stretching forth his good hand, something went off in him and he stretched forth his crippled hand. I'd like to tell you that when faith begins to work in your life, you begin to do things that you were not supposed to be able to do. 
you begin to act a little bit different. You begin to walk a little bit different. You begin to change a little bit different. You make a decision that you're going to separate from the doubters and the unbelief, and when Jesus begins to call you, you just rise up. Come on, somebody shout, rise up. And separate. He stepped forward. He separated. Separation's a powerful thing. Uh, when you're going to get set free, you'll find out every time God will separate you from something. Uh, because he is the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the savior. He's the one who knows how to not only break the power of your situation, but the control of others that are trying to control your life. That's important to get that in your spirit. He says, stretch forth your hand. And when Jesus stretched forth his hand, I mean, when the man stretched forth his hand to Jesus, he was going from the problem and suddenly beginning to stretch into the answer. Now, I don't know if that man thought he was going to get a miracle that day or not. The Bible doesn't say, so I won't be too presumptuous in that. But one thing I do know, when the Lord began to move his heart, just like I was looking at these beautiful people that made a decision, just like me and millions of others have done, that made that decision a moment ago, God was dealing with your heart, and you suddenly stretched toward the answer. Amen. I know Jesus could have just pointed that guy out in the crowd and said, hey, you, with the withered hand, stretch forth your hand. Jesus could have done anything, but that's not the way he did it. And this man had to participate some way in faith himself, in obedience. And he obeyed. And when he obeyed, that simple thing as step front, instead of saying, oh, he's just trying to make me uh, feel bad. He's going to embarrass me in front of everybody. He's going to do all of that. That man said something like, this is my opportunity because if this is the miracle guy and he happens to point me out and tell me to come that direction, it's very possible that this may be my day. Maybe he had heard about Jesus healing eyes and, and healing other things. Maybe he had heard about Jesus one time walking past a funeral procession and, and, and just touching the, the, the coffin bearer there. And when he did, the, the child just came back to life. How many of you are glad our God knows how to mess up a good funeral? Can I just say that Jesus gives you the power of separation. You can separate from what's trying to hold you down. He'll give you that extra. He'll give you his spirit. He'll give you his word, and he will empower you to power you. Listen, just listen to what he's saying to separate from that uh, sickness, separate from that bondage, separate from that bankruptcy. I'm preaching better than you're amen in right now. So what I like about this church, uh, one of the things I like about it so much, when this guy goes to church, He's got a withered hand, and he's not even supposed to be there. I can only imagine how many times he heard, you're not supposed to be there, you're not supposed to be there, you're not good enough to be there, you're yada, yada, yada. I can only imagine all of that. But he came anyway, even though he's got issues. I like going to a church when not everyone is perfect. First of all, I hadn't been to that church yet. And if you ever find it, don't join it because it won't be perfect any longer. So it's very important to hear that. That we are people that in life there are issues. Some of you had nothing to do with. You didn't have anything to do with those things being in your life. But it doesn't make any difference if that was a birth defect or if it had been in a fall or if he had been in a drunken stupor one night and fell and broke his hand. and all. I don't know how he had it. And Jesus didn't seem to care what the origin of it was. He just wanted to make sure that this man knew he had a whole different future when he made a step toward him. We serve the God of restoration. It doesn't make any difference how many issues from the past have happened. What makes a difference is how you respond when the Lord is, is calling you. You ever been in one of those perfect churches? I'm just asking. I'm just checking halos right now to see how we're, how we're leaning this morning. Very important to hear this in your spirit. Uh, we don't just come to the house of God and show God all of our good stuff. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's like when people are, are dating and they're, they're thinking about getting married and, 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 and it really takes some time. I said it takes some time. Be wise about that because the person you're dating is never the one you're going to marry. 
That's the one they're showing you. You just want to make sure you're not dating two people at one time. Does that make any sense to anyone? Look straight ahead. Don't look at you. Now, it's important to get this. As Christians today, we're two people. Uh, you're a new creation in Christ, but you're still you. Old things are, have passed away, and they are passing away. And you've got to realize that we are stepping toward the Lord constantly. And He is continually restoring and restoring and restoring. Hallelujah. We had a lady here in the church. I'll tell you this story real quick. We had a lady in the church here, uh, several years ago. She came here, and she walked up to me. She said, Pastor, I believe in God to get married. I want to be married, and I want to marry a good man. I said, well, there are some around. Praise the Lord. Talk to, talk to the head of the bride yourself, you know. Ask him how to help you, and we'll just see what happens. She said, I want to sow a seed. She did that. Now, I'm not about to take an offering, but I'm just saying she said, I want to sow a seed. Well, maybe I am. She said, I want to sow a seed. And so she sowed a seed. She said, I'm bringing this as a seed offering. I'm believing God. I said, well, praise the Lord. Let's just pray. I said, God, bless her. Uh, give her a desire of her heart. Give her a, a gentle man who's not an old brute, mean, and, and rough on her and all that kind of stuff. And somebody that loves the Lord. Don't ever marry an idiot. Give me two amens on idiot. Can you say that in church? We'll take that off. Of. <laughs> it's really important to hear this. Listen, be wise on those, on those things. And so, and I prayed something like that. God, bless her. Let it be a person that'll love her and, and, and has got a bunch of money. And it'll be good to her. Jesus' name, amen. That was the prayer. Uh, and, and because I believe God will do those things. Uh, sometime later, she came to service one evening and she had a gentleman with her. And she introduced me to him, nice fellow, uh, gave his life to the Lord and uh, had already given his life to the Lord. Uh, and so he came to church with her. It was, it was, she walked him up, introduced him to me after the service, said, nice to meet you and all of that. I said, well, that's good. Praise the Lord. It wasn't but a, a couple of months later, she comes walking in and she got a big old ring on her finger. And a, and a handsome man on her arm and a new car out front. And she got married. Now, they don't live here any longer, but she got married, and they're living for the Lord together still today. Amen. I'd like to tell you, when God begins to restore, it's amazing what God can do in your life. I want to encourage you this morning. One of the great, one of the great, qualities of the Holy Ghost. In Joel chapter 2, God says, I will restore unto you the years that the palmer worm, the caterpillar, the locust, the canker worm. He said, I'll restore the years. He said, I'll restore the years. Now listen, you can get a new car and you can get a ring. You don't even have to have Jesus in the middle of that. You can just go do whatever you want to do. But the one thing you can never restore yourself is time. God knows how to restore your time back to you. For you're not always saying things like, well, uh, I was in a bad situation and now I'm all crippled up emotionally and socially or physically and, and they took the best years of my life and they took the, uh, I gave them the best of me and now look at where it is today and, and now I've got all of these issues. Time out, time out, time out. Stand up, step forward. God is about to separate you from that and start restoring some years to you. He's the same yesterday today and forever. He said when the Holy Spirit is poured out on you, one of the first qualities of the Holy Spirit is He comes with that refreshing and He comes with that restoration. Reconstruct. So I'm not really sure exactly how that man looked after God restored his hand. But if God did a, not just uh, make it better, 
but if he reconstructed it, it's like he gave him a new bone structure. He gave him a total new healing. He made something new all over again. That's what the, that word apokathistomy actually means. And God redid it, restructured. Oh God, we don't want to survive yesterday. We want to have a structured life today that we can build upon that is powerful, that the gates of hell don't prevail against. And we want to be in the house of God and doing the work of God, not just where we show God all of our good stuff, but we come in there with the bad stuff so God can change us. I'm preaching better than you're amen and, and make us into what he wants us to be. Extremely important. So look, don't be judgmental about the people that are around you. I know they're not as pretty as you. Look at one, somebody and say, he's not talking about you. Come on, say that. <laughs> no, people come from all different stripes of life. They come from all different backgrounds. You might have been like me and you grew up in the house of God and were speaking in tongues before you were talking English almost because I had a Holy Ghost mom and daddy. Or you might have been someone who just got out of a bad issue yesterday. I've got good news. You've got a future. And God knows how to construct you and reconstruct you into the plan if you're willing to separate from some things that have held you back and controlled you, bound you up, limited you, but made your decision, no, I think I'm going to just step toward the answer. Because restoration happens when you let go of the past and you step toward Jesus. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord if you got that this morning. Come help me. God is a good God. He always has been and He always will be. Now just a few minutes ago, many people prayed to give their life to Jesus Christ. And I've got wonderful news. God heard your prayer. But maybe the situation you're dealing with before we do anything else, and we'll just be here for a few minutes now, but listen to this. Maybe that issue has already been solved. You've received Jesus. Maybe Jesus is Lord of your life. But it's not always just about being born again. It's not just about being filled with the Holy Ghost. It's about getting rid of the crippled places in our life. The Bible calls it being changed into His image. Instead of the image of the issues that we have dealt with in our life that have defined us, letting God change you a little more every day into His image. The Bible calls it from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. We, we're changed. We're changed a little bit more to be like Him every day. It's an immediate thing and it's an ongoing thing. And what a joy it is. God knows how to set you free at every stage of life, every encounter, and how to reconstruct you into His plan. If you're willing to rise and stretch toward Him. The Apostle Paul said it like this. He said, therefore I press. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. That word press is a word that literally means to stretch beyond measure. Everyone stick a hand out like this. Stick a hand out like this. Just stick it straight out. Now, just stick it out a little bit further. Now, just stick it out a little bit further. Come on, some of y'all. This is Holy Ghost calisthenic. Stretch a little bit more. Well, just do it a little bit more. Come on, stretch. Someone say stretch. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's not talking about just the obligatory, oh, I'm a Christian. No, no, no. He said, I press toward the mark. I stretch constantly beyond the limit. He said, I press, I stretch toward the mark for the prize, for what God can do in my life, the highest call. Every person has that prize in front of them for their life. We stretch toward it. We press toward it. And when you do, some people are going to come along with you. And some the Lord may have to stretch you away from. But you can be sure God's plan for your life is always going to be better than anything that your adversary planned for you. Come on, clap your hands to the Lord one time right there. 
So I'm not going to call you up front now at this point, but I'm going to ask you a quick question. If you say, Pastor, there are things in my life, it's not a matter of whether I'm saved or not, but I have some things that I need to get separated from. And I'm believing God this moment. It's a special moment for you. It's that now moment. I don't want you to tell me what it is, none of that. We're just going to stretch. If you have some areas there and you're like, God, I want to get separated from the pain of that situation. Help me, Lord. If that's you, quickly hold your hand up in the air. Just, just wave. God bless you. See, Christians, Christians sometimes come, put your hand up. Sometimes Christians come to church and they got situations. And the first thing the Lord says is rise up, step toward the answer, now stretch toward it. Uh, there's a separation that takes place. There's a great guy, listen, it, it, his name is uh, Fosbury, and he's a high jumper. You know, all the high jumpers, you see him in Fosbury, now you say, all the high jumpers today, when, the, uh, when, when they run, they run up to the bar and they throw their self over backwards. They throw themselves up, they jump up and throw themselves over backwards. Y'all see the high jumpers? But forever, forever, people did it like, uh, like we used to try to do it. You'd run up there and you'd try to jump over it. And there was all these techniques of trying to roll over it and move over it and all of that kind of stuff. Some people tried to step over. And people could, did some remarkable things. But Fosbury wanted to set world records. He wanted to do something different. And one day, he ran in one of the meets, and when he jumped, he went headfirst backwards over that. And they suddenly found out that mankind can jump higher that way. And so they were interviewing him, and they said, how in the world, what made you do it backwards like that? And that's how all the high jumpers are today. He said, well, I was analyzing it, and I knew if I could just get my heart up over the bar, the rest of me would have to naturally follow. Oh my God. I'm like, what a preacher. Have you ever noticed when you get your heart toward the Lord, everything else, hallelujah, just follows. Always has, always will. To learn more, visit walterhallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you in your daily walk with Christ. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there poverty in the world? Why can't I seem to recover from a loss? Pastor Walter Hallam tackles these and many more tough questions in his book, The Big Why. You'll learn how to view your memories as treasures and to cherish each one as they fuel you on to live a life full of faith and confidence. Make a bold confession, make a bold confession. God, you have another governor over your souls. Jesus Christ satisfies your soul when nothing else will.